big hug, you and all your friends that came here tonight. Thank you and God bless you. I want to thank uh, Nitzan Khen, the head of the government press office, uh, for mentoring this whole process. Yeah. Dear friends, and today uh, I'm uh, going to be finishing my second term as mayor of 10 years. Uh, I look back in retrospect and I'm very happy as to the trend the city is taking. I want to share with you a little bit of the role of Jerusalem, that vision that uh, Mike and I, and I believe we all have, is a common denominator for people around the world. And to best understand that vision and future, please allow me to take you back 3,000 years to the time where the people of Israel came back from Egypt after hundreds of years of slavery to the land of Israel. Each of the 12 Jewish tribes had a piece of land. You can see these uh, Google these old biblical maps of the allotment of the tribes, the 12 tribes in Israel. And every tribe had its piece of land, except Jerusalem. Jerusalem was between Benjamin and Judah. And it was planned by King David to be the city that belongs to all tribes. The Bible talked about Jerusalem making all people friends because the inflow of pilgrims, Jews and non-Jews alike, 3,000 years ago, mind you, there were still no Christians. You folks came a thousand years later. The Muslim came 1,600 years later. Yet that thousand years of Jerusalem was the common denominator of all people of faith. And that inflow and outflow to the city of Jerusalem created that feeling of togetherness that is so important for the future of the world. They also say that Jerusalem in Hebrew, Ki mitzion tetzet Torah. From Zion, new Torah comes out. Torah is thought leadership, holiness, new standards in the world. Because anything that was successful in Jerusalem, immediately, now we've got the larger social media uh, uh, with you folks. But in the t at the time, I don't remember, there was still no social media. Yet all the pilgrims go back home and people ask them, what's new in the city of Jerusalem? Because if it functions in a city that belongs to all, it means that Jerusalem created de facto standards. So the idea and the vision of the past is actually the vision of the future. To make Jerusalem open for the benefit of the world to enjoy. To make sure that people, when they come to our city, have respect for different people than they are. In one square kilometer, right behind you where I'm pointing, in ancient city of Jerusalem, in one square kilometer, we have more functioning, functioning mosques, synagogues, and churches than anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world, number one. And that openness and respect in the street is something we cherish, which is part of the vision. So that openness and making Jerusalem successful is fundamental, not just for Jerusalemites, who are 900,000 strong, not just for Israelis, who are 8 million strong, but for practically all people, billions of people around the world. And so, in the last decade, I've dramatically increased not only the digging and connecting to the past that you could today go to the ancient city of David and see the streets where kings and prophets practically walked, uh, with a good guy, you open up the Bible and everything connects. Two-thirds of the Bible happened on the hills behind us, right here. And by opening up that past, we connect to people's heart. We want to share, as long as you come peacefully to our city, we love to share and enable each faith to practice their own religion, their way, side by side to the others. But as a high-tech entrepreneur, we also put a lot of gas on the pedal in the future. Today, uh, in the last decade, uh, we've dramatically increased um, the high-tech sector in our city from 200 to 600 startups. Today, Jerusalem is ranked 25th in the world in terms of uh, scope of the high-tech hub. Uh, and growing, we're the fastest growing market share practically in the world, and increasing over 15% year after year, the scope of our high-tech, which is 
very, very big and nice, and I'm very happy with that. And we change the atmosphere. I think Jerusalem today is very bullish. Uh, we're going through a cultural renaissance. Tourism is over doubled in the last decade. The hotel industry is doubling in its size. And all trends show that we're in the right direction. Um, and I'm very proud of that. In terms of security, uh, I dare you to Google and see, you come from different cities around the world, in the United States, I assume, most of you. Jerusalem is 10 times safer than an average American city. Right. I was in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Congress challenged me before the move of the embassy. Is it safe to move the embassy to Jerusalem? <laughs> so there are 15 murders for every 100,000 residents in Washington, D.C. And in Jerusalem, one. That's crime and terror together. Jerusalem is one of the safest cities in the world. People ask me, is there going to be violence by moving the embassy to Jerusalem? And I said, no. Actually, this year, since the decision, not even the move itself, of moving the embassy, Jerusalem has become extremely quiet in terms of security. And while there may be very challenges in Gaza, it doesn't reflect on Jerusalem. And here's a message I want you to take home, which is an important element in the decision of moving the embassy to Jerusalem. Tectonic plates have moved, not less. And here's why the Arab world and the many, many of our Arab residents in Jerusalem said the following, think about it psychologically. If America, Israel's best friend, is stuttering by moving the embassy, it means that even America is not sure about the future of the city of Jerusalem. So if the American president is afraid to sign or to, uh, uh, and, and release and move the embassy, why should we take a stand? And we had many, many of them sitting on the fence waiting to see. Because from them, from their perspective, until America makes that decision, they must stand on the, stand on the sideline and not integrate as one united city. Once that move is made, all of a sudden we feel many, many of our Arab residents want to be civilians. Many of them move to the Israeli education system. They did not do that in the past. And for every practical purpose, they're becoming more and more citizens of the United City of Jerusalem. And this is very important. And I know that this has ripple effect um, on many, many other uh, um, countries around in the Middle East. They understand that America is extremely serious in the alliance with Israel. And they understand that they must be on the right side of this uh, uh, issue. Because at the same time, as we know to be very bad with the bad guys, very aggressive with terrorists, very aggressive against Iran, and be very black and white, as Mike said. Be extremely black with the black guys, with the bad guys. And be really, really good with the good guys. And the investments we're making in East Jerusalem are dramatic. Never has the Israeli government and the municipality invested so much in our Arab residents. So that brings them closer to us. And that's what brings us to focus on economic prosperity, on better education, on infrastructure, and we don't need to focus on defense as much as needed in the past. So by the bold move President Trump has made in alliance with the, our Prime Minister Netanyahu, has brought a lot of quiet to the region. And I want to thank President Trump and the whole administration, and of course our Prime Minister Netanyahu for that partnership, but I also want to thank Mike, and many, many other friends that we have in America for that ecosystem you created in America to support the decision of President Trump. I said to Mike when we're having a dinner now that I saw President Trump and uh, Vice President Pence when they were here in Jerusalem. I saw them connect to Jerusalem. I felt, I saw in their face, in their speeches, how we made a big difference on the way they think, and their commitment to the Jewish state. So again, 
please convey my message with a big, big thank you to President Trump, Vice President Pence, and all of you. Thank you so much. I want to mention one more thing and then maybe take a few questions. Um, just over a month ago, President Trump made another very important, bold decision to stop funding UNRWA. UNRWA is a bad organization. It was founded in 1967, before Jerusalem was reunited, to take care of what is so-called the Palestinian refugees. Refugees that are inherited year after year, uh, uh, decade after decade, from father to son to grandson. It doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. As a matter of fact, you don't know of one Jewish refugee. Not one. Because anywhere in the world, if the Jewish state finds a Jew in trouble, and many, many times not even just Jews, we will go and send our missions to help people and rehabilitate, rehabilitate them and make sure they succeed in life. By keeping them refugees, they're in many, many ways um, a hostage for a potential political solution in the future. And guess what happens? Year after year, they're fundamentally failed in resolving the problem. And the refugees in refugee camps and other places are going backwards versus in going forwards. And in Jerusalem, where we have 900,000 residents, 300,000 Arab residents, all of them, practically all of them, are residents of the city of Jerusalem. They get the services from the municipality, except a few thousand that are also defined refugees. So I took advantage of the decision President Trump made and prepared a plan to replace, to replace all UNRWA services in our city. May they be in education, in cleaning, may it be in health services, to replace those services by municipal services and kick them out of here. We don't want them here. Treat them all as residents, give them what they need to get as, a, as every other uh, Arab residents, and get this issue off the table. And with Prime Minister Netanyahu's help, hopefully we'll be able to fill this plan. It's a plan that will roll out, hopefully in the future. And you're then cleaning another issue that is sitting for ages, for 70 years, um, and not enabling us to bring real peace with the Palestinians. Uh, and I hope and believe that by tackling this issue and removing them from uh, Jerusalem altogether, we could pave the way for the Palestinian Authority to take responsibility of the so-called refugees, wherever they are in the Palestinian, in the West Bank, or other places around the world, and show a uh, an example of how to do it right versus how to do it wrong. This is again inspired by the decision that uh, President Trump has made. I want to thank him again for that as well. So, folks, you are strategic partners to our city and our country. And I'm very, very honored and uh, proud to speak to you here tonight. Uh, Mike, you touched me and you moved me by this huge honor. I'm your friend forever. You can count on me. I don't know, I'm gonna finish my role as mayor um, in a month and uh, join Prime Minister Netanyahu in the Likud party in the next uh, primaries and hopefully next time we meet, I'll be in another role, but I'm committed to serve my city and my country and I'm committed to be your friend forever. Thank you so much for listening to me.